Hello everyone, welcome to the B1 program. This lecture is called P108.2. Okay, this is the second part of the lecture where we are looking at the applications of Newtonian mechanics and Newton's laws, right? So we are going to look at the applications. What are the applications with the different laws of Newton? So uh, before going into the application level, I have to introduce some basic force laws, right? So there are some basic force laws in nature, which uh, you can use. You can use to manipulate the surroundings and to derive some finite count quantities that are useful for you guys. So how to do that? Okay, let's first introduce the slightly complicated but very useful Hooke's law right so the first law is called the Hooke's law so what does the Hooke's law stands for and what does it tells us okay what's the gain from that so Hooke's law states that okay Hooke's law does this okay if you have a rigid surface right a very rigid surface and what are you going to do is that you have a spring okay you have a spring like this and you are going to attach a mass, a massive body, in the end of the spring with mass m. And then what you are going to do is that you are going to now shift this position of m by pulling from this direction. By pulling in this direction, you are going to shift the mass to a new location, say okay this is the new location of that mass so now you have what you have done is that you have shifted from this position say x some delta x distance to the new position x bar right so that's what you have done now understanding what is happening behind right you can say maybe you can do you can say that this direction can be taken as negative we need to follow the sign convention and the uh, coordinate axis because in if you fail to do that your problems all your problems will be wrong if you don't follow the co exact sign convention what goes left i am taking as negative and what goes to the right i am taking it as positive okay for all the rest of this problem so this is the problem right here now I need to find out what is actually happening behind it and how is going to be this mass behave okay with this spring there okay so technically if you want to physically understand you can zoom in right so what you can do is that you can just zoom in to the system of this spring and you can maybe uh, find out uh, you can, if you zoom in, you can find out a part of this system where you see like the spring can be enhanced low, large and the spring will look something like this, right? So the part of the spring will so look something like this. And if you zoom it again, right? If you zoom it again and you will get a small fraction, a part of this structure this whole structure it will be consisting of atoms atoms of spring steel spring then steel atoms steel is an alloy it's a compound anyways that those atomic scale when you go to the atomic scale you can see that when you stretch this string this uh, spring spring part then what you are going to do is that what you are actually doing is you are you are forcing these bonds these bonds between these two atoms inside this steel spring to expand on either directions so you are expanding the spring in such a way that the bond is being stretched right so this length this expansion length let's call it delta e right so these delta e everywhere there is some delta e okay uniform stretching right so these delta E's adds up to, all the delta E will add up to the total distance it has been stretched. So that total distance was the 
stretch stretch stretched distance of the horse mass right the mass has now been shifted by the under the expense of the stretching of this string this spring so this delta x is the total distance covered so all the these tiny fractions of extensions or expansions of uh, the this this material is adds up to the delta x or you can simply say uh, integral from x1 to x2 or x to x bar uh, de will be gives you the total distance delta x so that's a basic way of understanding what is happening right what now you can do is that as you can clearly see if you apply higher force right if you apply higher force to this mass then this this distance will increase right the spring will extend much further if you apply higher force which is larger uh, f2 is greater than f1 and we have two forces right and if you apply f2 then the distance stretched by, by the same mass okay the distance stretched by the same mass will be higher so delta say x2 will be higher than delta of x1 that's the shift of f2 when apply f2 and shift when when you apply delta uh, shift when you apply f1 so that kind of shifts will be higher if higher the force so that's the direct consequence so you can maybe write down a direct proportionality and you can say f is proportional to delta x right so f is directly proportional to delta x so you can other ways you can say that f must be equal to some constant times delta x right so f must be some equal to some constants times delta x this constant k is called the coefficient of force constant okay this k is called force constant so that's k okay now that's called force constant and now uh, one key important thing that you need to look out for is that these uh, when you apply the force in one direction right when you apply this force in one direction uh, the force of the spring will pull it pull you back right so the mass is being pulled back by this spring force right if you pull in this direction the mass will pull you back the spring will pull you pull the mass back in this direction so whatever the force you are applying the force constant or the force by the reaction force action reaction force according to newton's third law the reaction force would be in the opposite direction so you can say f must be equal to direction also taken into accounts minus sign k times delta x right this is a very basic thing now something there is something called the equivalence principle okay equivalence principle so equivalence principle says that uh what does it stands for it, it it stands for the equivalence of force okay that's as simple as that so if you find out that force must be equal to some minus k times uh, delta x or x then that force must be in magnitude equal to the m times a which is a newton's second law right x is a direction force is a, is a vector well what does it mean is that this mass which you are which is under the influence of this force the mass which is under the influence of force is going to accelerate it is going to accelerate in this direction and that acceleration which is hardly uh, measurable it is hard to measure such accelerations and these acceleration must be equal with this equivalence equation so this ac acceleration is actually the acceleration of the mass under the influence of that force so f is equal to minus kx must be equal to ma that is a very basic principle that is easily understandable or you can say the a must be equal to minus k by m times x okay i just rearranged that right or you can simply say what we have done earlier the a is just dv by dt right so dv by dt is just 
d square x by dt square or x double dot okay whatever that is convenient for you guys so that is equal to minus k by m x right so this is a very good equation right what does this equation stands for well it stands for dx square by dt square okay look at that so it's a time rate of change of velocity and it is the time rate of time rate of change of position okay that is equal to some k by m x that it gives you the position as a function of time right so let me explain it in a simple manner if you have a mass and you are extending it under the influence of some force then this mass is going to be uh, at this position somehow okay under the influence of force and this uh, mass after being released okay it will take it will go back into this direction right so it will go back into this direction just like that and then it starts to oscillate right you can imagine that okay if you release that mass back into its equilibrium position right this is the starting position you extended it to this far say x distance and now when you release it it will go back right it will go backwards so when it goes goes back and it is going to reach back to the equilibrium position back to the equilibrium position it is not going to stop there because it is it is constantly being pulled down by this spring and there is an acceleration so the accelerating body will actually won't stop until the acceleration is dissipated so right this acceleration has to be dissipated there is, must be some stopping force inertia the first law right so this body will continue its direction of motion and the spring will compress the spring will compress and the reverse of what has happened earlier the bonds inside the spring atoms were being uh, were being elasticized or extended in the earlier part now these atoms are being compressed right compressed to the inside so if that happens if compression is going to happen then this this mass this spring okay this spring when it is being compressed like that it will start to push back and then it will move back and it will oscillate this mass is going to oscillate in either directions that's what that's what's going to happen so when that oscillation happens right when that oscillation happens we need to find out where it will be in real time okay that's an issue here okay that's the main concern here we need to find out exactly what position it is in after some time so that's what we are going to do now okay so what we are going to do now is that we are going to take back the equation which is x double dot is equal to minus k by m x right so or dx square by dt square is equal to minus k by m x and now what i'm going to do is that so i'm going to write it down like this so d square x by dt square is equal to minus k by m x okay this is the equation now i need to solve this equation to find out x as a function of time that's that's the hardly layer it's not going to be easy because i need to solve a second order differential equation so instead of that what i'm going to do is that i'm going to do a simple technique that i can think of right what i can do is that you can see that the differential of x with respect to time the second derivative of that is equal to some constant this is a constant k by m times x times x so some function when you take the second derivative right is equal to some constant times the minus sign of course times f of x the same function so that's the how the function looks like now i'm going to do is that i'm going to look for the functions which functions when you take the derivative uh and the second derivative you get the same function plus some constant what kind of functions look like that so there are some functions like that the first function is some of the trigonometric functions like sin of x or cos of x or even 
exponential function e raised to x they all behave just like that so exponential function e raised to x doesn't give you a negative sign okay but um, sin x and cos x gives you okay so what i'm going to do is that i'm going to inst in install a trial function a trial function means something i'm going to check out okay so i'm going to put down f of x must be equal to and my assumption here some a cos x plus b sin x so that's my assumption here okay so if i do that then when i take the derivative f dash of x i'll get uh, minus a sin x plus b uh, cos x right okay and when i take the second derivative i'll get minus a cos x plus minus b sin x or you can simplify that and you can say that this is equal to minus of a cos x plus b sin x right i take, took the minus sign outside now a cos x plus b sin x is equal to f of x right so that's the same so you can say this is equal to minus of f of x so what we got is that f double dash of x is equal to minus of f of x second derivative is equal to the the function itself with a minus sign so that's our function this is a very good guess right so we guessed it now what we need is we don't just need that we need uh, x as a function of time and x double dash of x of t must be equal to minus sign by root uh, k by m times x right so that's what we want so we are missing a k by m here so i'm going to put down a k by m in this equation so that it will give you a k by m so what i'm going to do is that i'm going to write down this equation just like that so i'm going to write down this equation f of x f of x must be equal to some a right so it will look like a cos root of k by m x plus b sin square root of k by m x okay i'm going to write it down like that so what does it do is that when you take the first derivative f of f dash of x you get what root k by m will come outside and you get what minus a sin root k by m x plus b cos root k by m x right so that's what you get and when you take the second derivative you, you get k by m and the minus sign outside times a cos uh, root k by m x plus b sine sorry about that sine root k by m x that's what you get right so we got that this is equal to f of x this is actually f of x right this f of x so uh, we got something that is does our job right this is this is the equation that do the job that we intended to so we can now write this in, a, in our required form right our required form was what was x double dot our equation was x double dot is equal to minus k by m x so x will be some a as a function of time a cos root k by m t plus b sin root k by m t right so that's our function that can give you that when you do your uh, the, the second derivative x double dot you get x double dot you get minus k by m times a cos k root k by m, this this value so that is f of x or x 
right so this is a solution here okay this is a solution so what does this equation gives us okay what is the advantage of having this equation so this equation gives us the real time position of this mass okay this mass which is oscillating around right this mass which is oscillating in either direction which position it is in at time at different times at time t1 at time t2 okay where it, where this position is okay we can define that using this equation that's the actual use of this equation so this is a bit complicated let's let's uh, understand our situation and we can let's simplify this solution right so what i'm going to do is that when we are having a spring and we are attaching it to it at time is equal to zero we are going to extend the, this uh, spring this spring to a new position right so to a new position we are going to extend it using some force and this fo position is our x max which is the maximum distance we have uh, ex extended this spring right so this is called the x max so the x max distance has been given so when we start from t is equal to zero we are at x max we extended the spring we pulled it max to the maximum and then released it okay so at t is equal to zero we are at x max so let's put that in this equation right in this equation so at t is equal to zero x is at x max so x max must be equal to some a cos zero cos t is equal to zero plus b sine uh, zero right so uh, x max must be equal to some a right so a here is called the amplitude so a is called the amplitude so if you got that then uh, our generic equation will look like x will be some x max or amplitude you can write it both ways so some x max times cos right square root of k by m times t right so you can write it down like that so this is called the equation of motion right this is the equation of motion for this mass bo massive body that is moving under the influence of spring force right this root k by m has a name okay if you look at this whatever that is inside the cos component or sine component must be dimensionless right so it, there must be there mustn't be any dimension for this thing so uh, k by m must be equal to has must have the dimensions of t right must have the dimensions of t right so <clears throat> or of 1 by t right so it has to cancel right so if k by m has to cancel the dimensions of t it k root k by m has must have the dimensions of 1 by t so this root k by m is called omega right omega must have the dimensions of 1 by t and this omega is called the angular velocity angular frequency right angular frequency so omega is called angular frequency frequency so uh, what does this gives us root k by m so this is a function that is adding on to this rotation so angular frequency gives us when this mass is moving in to and fro motion right moving like that it is oscillating then how much what number of times it oscillates it oscillates like this to and fro okay how many number of times it oscillates in one second is equal to omega which is omega f omega angular frequency this is different from uh, the case when we had a rotating body and then there was some theta and we found out d theta by dt in the earlier lecture is equal to omega which is omega v which is angular velocity okay it's a distance traveled across by the uh, the number of times it rotates around this circle in one second that is omega v right so omega f is different omega f is different which is the number of to and fro motions to and fro motions that it can have the massive body can have that that's the equation right if you plot this equation you get 
something like a cos curve right so it's a cos curve in time versus uh, position axis right in the time versus position axis it will looks like cause some cause component which is which looks like this okay it will oscillate like that so that's the position versus time graph and that's the position versus time component of this motion this motion is called symbol harmonic motion this is called symbol harmonic motion okay so this is called the symbol harmonic motion this equation is called the symbol harmonic motion equation okay this is how you solve all kinds of symbol harmonic motions and there is one more thing one more tiny bit of uh, stuff before we close in we remember that f must be equal to some minus kx right so f is equal to minus some minus kx that means the the slope of the graph okay it, it goes from uh, say this body is moving from negative x max through the origin right to the positive x max right it's oscillating like that so that's the condition here so that's the uh, force acting on this body so if that's the case then we can say that uh, this force equation is having you, you can see that if you draw f versus position graph force versus position graph what happens to the force uh, in to at different positions right so what happens is that it has a slope of minus k right so f by x is equal to minus k that means it has a negative slope f minus minus x is an f by x is a uh, have minus k slope that's that's why f by x is equal to minus k so it has a negative slope slope of k and so that's what what is happening so what happens is that at x equal to zero here at the origin this has no uh, force right so f equal to zero in this equation so you can see the line will look like the force curve will look like this negative slope force curve will look like that so what does it tells you is that Le this force curve what does it tells you is that let's redraw redraw this like that okay through the origin okay through the origin sorry about that anyways it goes to a maximum this, this is the force this is the position right this is negative x and this is negative f so it goes to a maximum that is x max right this is x max and then comes back right comes back to the negative x max and what happens with the force is that it goes to a force maximum f max and then it goes to a negative f max this force is called negative f max is called the compression force right so it's a compression force and this is called the ex expansion force of the spring so uh, restoring forces are like that so this is all the things that you need for understanding Hooke's law and symbol harmonic motion and uh, the force acting and real-time position of a moving body under the influence of spring forces okay so I'm going to close in this part right here and I hope you guys understood very much uh, about this and let's see you next time okay